All right, here we go. It is Tuesday. It's week five. It's CVPP, cardiovascular pathology. Haven't got the pulmonary yet. Trying out a new mic today, so it's a deity mic, shotgun type mic. So let's see how that does today. So we need to talk about the circle of Willis because we're going to get into berry aneurysms here. So that's where we're headed got to know about berry aneurysm. Circle Willis, this of course is a bird's eye view or an S to eye view or an axial view of the floor of the skull with the calvarium removed, like the top of the skull removed. And you can see the, this is the, called the circle of Willis or the cerebral arterial circle or circulus arteriosus. So watch out for those AKAs. It's said to be at the base of the brain, and it's formed by two systems, the vertebrobasilar system, which is made of the basilar artery, and then the internal carotid artery system, which is made by the internal carotid artery. It's said to be located in the middle cranial fossa. Let's look at that. So remember the fossa, there's the anterior, middle, and posterior cranial fossa. This would be out of the plage, pain, plage, uh, out of the pa plane of the page. This would be a little deeper into the plane of the page, and this would be the deepest into the plane of the page. So it's kind of like stair steps here. And so it lives in the middle cranial fossa. Technically, it's within the subarachnoid space, so if you do get a bleed in this region, you've got yourself a subarachnoid hemorrhage which is extremely dangerous it is surrounded or it surrounds several structures so osseous structures the clivus the sphenoid portion of the clivus cella tersica and the optic chiasma right so remember our and back in second quarter we talked a lot about osteology of the cranium but uh, Celeturska is that bony little saddle right there where the pituitary sits. There's the clivus, the sphenoid portion of the clivus, um, and it sits around those guys. The anterior clinoid processes kind of support it. Uh, usually internal carotid artery comes under there, but those anterior clinoid processes are there as well. And, yep, optic chiasma, which also would also sit right in the middle of this, as we will see in a little while. Who are the members of the Circle of Willis? Got to know these. Easy, easy question. So there is a basilar artery, which gives rise to two a left and a right posterior cerebellar artery. And then there's a connection off the posterior cerebellar artery called the posterior communicating artery, which goes up to the very end of the internal carotid artery. And then we have an anterior cerebellar artery and an anterior communication between them. Let's take a look at this. You need to know this. I could ask questions. I have asked questions before on this. You knew it, and you know I do like my anatomy. So here's the basilar artery, which was formed by the vertebral arteries, right? The vertebral arteries were down here. Dead ends right here, and it splits into a right and left posterior cerebral artery. But there's a branch that comes off the posterior cerebellar artery called the posterior communicating artery, which plugs right into the very end of the internal carotid artery. And then we have another big branch splitting off the end of the, in fact, this is one of the terminal ends of the internal carotid artery, is this anterior cerebellar artery in blue, which I should have made it blue, keep going right up. And then between the right and left anterior cerebellar arteries, there's a communicating artery called the anterior communicating cerebellar artery, or anterior communicating branch of the circle of Willis, if you will, or anterior communicating artery. And yeah, that's the story. Now we can see the optic chiasma, how it's kind of in centered in between, pretty much right in the middle of that. All right, there's another picture. This is complicated anatomy here, so there's we learned that in gross two anatomy, the internal carotid artery kind of does a double 
kind of a, a U-turn right here and comes back. Uh, usually goes under the the anterior clivus, which is right here. And so it dead ends right here. So here's the it goes. There's the internal carotid artery. It goes under this branch, this artery, anterior cerebral artery. It's coming up here, and it dead ends and splits into two branches, anterior cerebellar artery, middle cerebellar artery, and that's the end of it. And then the posterior communicating artery plugs in to this very last part of the internal carotid artery. So that's the story with that. So berry aneurysms, these are the most common type of brain aneurysm that there is. Of all the brain aneurysms, the berry aneurysm is the most common. It makes up about 90% of them. We talked about the different types of aneurysms. There's true aneurysms, false aneurysms. Of the false and of the true aneurysm, of the true aneurysms, there's a saccular and a fusiform. Saccular, remember, has here's the here's an artery. Saccular has one little piece that has herniated way out and looks like a sac. So that's a saccular aneurysm. Um, so these berry aneurysms are always saccular aneurysms. Fusiform would mean the whole, there's just a weakness and the whole wall is pushed out kind of uniformly. Um, so bear, a rupture of a barrier or a bleed or a rupture of a berry aneurysm is the most frequent cause of a subarachnoid hemorrhage. And it gets into the subarachnoid space, and we'll look at what happens. But let's remember that subarachnoid space. So here's the skull, the, uh, the bone. Right underneath the bone, we have dura mater. And right underneath dura mater, there's arachnoid mater. And there should be a space between here. Maybe not that big. But we we're just watching... Um, what is that called? Yellowstone. What a great, expensive, but great, uh, great series so far. We watched season one, but uh, one of the characters got a spoiler alert. Got a subdural hematoma. So you can get hematomas in this pit, in this space, potential space between the arachnoid and dura mater. Then we have the subarachnoid space. There's the brain, and stuck to the brain, that's the pia mater. And the cerebellar, part of the members of the circle of Willis, live kind of stuck on top of the pia mater. So if you get a bleed here, the blood is going to fill the subarachnoid space. And we'll see what happens if there's other arteries in here. We'll see what happens to those in a bit. Right Here's kind of a coronal view cross-sectional view. Remember the dura mater is a little weird. There's kind of two sheets of it. Uh, but anyway, it just shows basically the same thing. Uh, here is the brain. Of course, this gray right here would be the pia mater. Then we have the subarachnoid space and this, what color would that be? Brown. That would be the arachnoid mater. And then the dura mater uh, would be right on top of that in gray here. And there's a little white subdural space there that can fill with blood. So these berry aneurysms, they don't have to occur in the circle of Willis, but most of them do. They especially like to occur at the junctions of the circle of Willis. Diagnosed in about 30 million Americans each year, about 4% of the population, that's a big number, uh, is walking around with one in, one of these. And you could live your whole life with one of these and it doesn't rupture or cause any trouble. Uh, but they're breeding grounds for thrombus formation as well, like any saccular aneurysm, because you could throw a, a embolus, or you know, shouldn't call it this, but you could throw a clot, blood clot, from uh, and thrombus formation, which forms in here. What's the ideology of these things? And why are they always saccular aneurysms? So it's thought that you're born with a, uh, a defect in the tunica media. Specifically, you don't have much of a tunica media, or maybe you have no tunica media at all. And cadavers who people have died from these, on autopsies, they've found these people don't have a tunica media in the vicinity or in, 
in the actual aneurysm, and there's no uh, internal or external elastic laminae. That should actually be external. 14, external elastic laminae, not internal. Uh, but it makes them weak and susceptible. Can't handle the pressure if you don't have all the a thick and, and healthy wall. Fun facts. Uh, these are, we're, we're going to talk about vertebral artery dissections. Uh, these are much more common. The dissections are incredibly rare. They do happen, but they're really rare. They typically occur in the anterior circulation, so that's the internal carotid artery, the anterior cerebral artery, the anterior communicating artery. They especially like the junction of where they attach, like the anterior communicating where it attaches to the end of the internal carotid artery. And if you see one aneurysm, always look for others because about a quarter of the people do have more than one. So in general, 66, about two-thirds of them actually occur within the circle of Willis. Some of them occur at junctions elsewhere. So here's one of the first takeoffs of the middle cerebral artery. Here's 34% of them occur right around this region. Uh, but the rest of them occur in the circle of Willis themselves, especially right where they enter communicating and the enter cerebral artery kind of come together. It's a common spot for them to occur. Another spot is right here. So these you got to watch out for. These can cause some visual problems in this region. And if they come off, it's kind of rare, but if they they come off, or even this, they can affect the cranial, the cranial nerve 3, oculomotor nerve. Which, which runs right next to them. So we'll talk about some of that in a bit. Some more fun facts. So after diagnosis, as long as they're small, and, and the definition of small is anything less than 10 millimeters. So if they're a run-of-the-mill aneurysm, only about 1% of them bleed per year. So it's typically not I mean, it doesn't usually happen. Bleeding is a very serious situation, though. Valsalva's events, pushing down really hard, uh, is a risk factor for these things. If they're over 10 millimeters in size, they're large, and about 50% of them do hemorrhage within one year. So that's not a good thing. What if it does rupture? Well, if it ruptures, then just think of a river if you carve a big hole out of a, a river, you're going to siphon river water off from that river, and the river is going to become a, a stream, not much flow downstream to where the siphon occurs, and that's exactly what a, a burst is, like if this is a, you know, here's your, here's your brain right here. You have this blood vessel go into it to supply blood, right, so blood is going up, this is very simple, and you have an aneurysm right here, and it bleeds, well, instead of all the blood going to the brain, some of the blood's going to be leaking out in the subdural space. So you get an ischemia, a downstream ischemia, and it'll kill brain tissue. And that is the definition of a stroke. Get different degrees of motor, sensory, memory, autonomic problems. Very serious type of thing. Let's introduce the weird two-thirds rule. I just put this in. Brand new slide, so... Didn't, people in the last quarter didn't get this, but this is really weird. It's worth kind of bringing this forward. So what are some high-risk activities? If you have a small one, what's a risk for a bleed? So 33% of these things occur during some, some event or activity that raises the interthecal pressure. What's interthecal? Well, that's the that means it's inside the thecal sac and inside the the dura mater of the brain. And these are Valsalva's events, like sport, like weightlifting here. Like the last picture, straining, constipation, sitting and pushing real hard, or delivery, having a, a baby. Uh, intercourse, orgasm, those are all Valsalva's events. 33% will bleed. That'll cause the bleed. Another weird rule of thirds so what happens if it does bleed? So what are the outcomes of a bleed uh, in the circle of Willis? 33% die immediately. They become unconscious and they never wake up. 
33% become unconscious, but they stay alive. And that is not a good omen. They may wake up. They may not wake up. Um, they may have a permanent stroke-related neurological deficit. So they're kind of iffy. 33% of them actually stay conscious and don't don't go into become unconscious. They do pretty well as long as there's not multiple aneurysms and they don't occur again. So the rule of thirds, I guess you could say, because 33% is a third. What are the classic symptoms of a bleed? Very similar to a migraine headache, actually, uh, with with a couple exceptions. My wife had a migraine just started getting one. She's probably about 55, got her first migraine. And, oh, my God, I was terrified. I thought it was a stroke. But luckily, her neurologically, she was okay. But every single one of these, well, except for seizure and neurological deficit, she had. So I had to rush her to the hospital. I just couldn't, didn't want, didn't want to mess with something like that. But horrible, 10-10 headache. Um, severe, worst pain you can imagine. Nausea and vomiting. Blurred, double vision, photo, photophobia, lights, got to turn off the lights. And then that, that can all be migraine, but if you go into a seizure, that's most likely not a migraine. And if you have any type of neurological deficit, that's not a migraine either. Collateral damage. So here's another, another weird thing about a bleed of the circle of Willis. So... I mean, the bleed of the circle of Willis is bad enough because you're you're getting ischemia of all the brain tissue that the circle of Willis supplies. But there's another problem: if you the free blood floating around in the subarachnoid space, there's other blood vessels that live in that subarachnoid space that supply other parts of the brain. And if they get exposed to free blood their endothelial cells freak out and release nitric or release endothelin, a powerful, powerful vasoconstrictor, as well as arachnidonic acid, which starts an inflammation. Uh, but that in and of itself, the neighboring blood vessels can completely shut down, which causes another downstream ischemia and more brain tissue death. So it worsens the stroke because of this. Even though there's nothing wrong with the the adjacent blood vessels. So blood vessels don't like to be touched by someone else's blood. I guess the moral of this story is there. Hydrocephalus, so uh, because of the arachnidonic acid and the inflammation that is also released, you can get a lot of scar tissue buildup within the subarachnoid space, and that can interfere with the flow of cerebrospinal fluid through the subarachnoid space. And it can start to back up and cause pressure. That scar tissue can act like a beaver dam because that cerebrospinal fluid is dumping into the superior sagittal sinus. You'll remember back from your anatomy. And if you get a beaver dam in there, you can get pressure kind of from the inside out of the brain, and it can damage the brain and cause something called hydrocephalus when the pressure builds up inside your brain in the ventricles of the brain or the subarachnoid space. Uh, that can kill somebody just in and of itself. It actually happens to some degree in about 25% of people who've suffered a, berry, a bleeding berry aneurysm. What about visual field carotid artery aneurysms and visual field disturbances? Uh, yep, so if, the, if you get a if berry aneurysm in the terminal part, of the cro internal carotid artery, it can compress the lateral portion of the optic chiasma. And if that part of the optic chiasma is compressed, the patient is going to have a nasal visual field disturbance ipsilaterally, so same side. So in other words, if you have them look through the left eye, they have a darkness on the nasal side of the vision. If you cut the vision in half, we have a temporal field visual, a temporal visual field and nasal visual field. Half of their vision will be gone toward their eye on the same side as the lesion. So let's look at a cartoon of that. Um, so here is a perfectly placed 
internal carotid artery berry aneurysm that's compressed this part of the optic chiasma. Remember the optic nerve, if this is the eyeball, I think I have a better picture of this, but this goes to the temporal portion of the retina. So if you lose the temporal portion of the retina, you lose your nasal field vision. Ipsilaterally. Ipsilaterally means on the same side of the lesion. Okay, make sure I do like to ask questions on this stuff. I do dive a little into neural anatomy here. So let's remember the, the tracks. I'm not going to get into all this, but you should definitely know this for boards. Uh, I'm going to get into mine, which isn't e even on here. But if you get a berry aneurysm just right, it can knock out the optic chiasma right here and see how it knocks out the optic nerve and the optic track is interfered with. So this part of the nerve supplies the temporal retina so you lose your nasal field vision in the left eye in this case. All right, so this is gone. See how that works? And there's a name for that. That's called monocular nasal hemianopia. Hem, E, N, op, like pop. I'm from Michigan, so pop, I say pop, and not soda. Hemianopia. Mono meaning one eye, nasal field, hemianopia. Half the nasal field vision is gone. Got it? What about a posterior communicating artery aneurysm? Now these aren't, they don't happen that often, but this is another chance for me to have you recall some of that gross two anatomy and some neural anatomy. Um, so if you get a an aneurysm of the posterior communicating artery, the optic, the oculomotor nerve, cranial nerve 3, runs adjacent to it. And you can compress it and injure it and get what's called a palsy. Whenever a cranial nerve is not working and messed up, you get what's called a palsy. Paralysis means a, a complete loss of voluntary movement. Paresis is an incomplete loss of voluntary movement. I'm sure you know that already. But make sure you know those words if you don't. So what's the ocular motor nerve? And here's the cartoon of it. All right, so here's the posterior communicating artery. Um, here's the basilar artery. Vertebral arteries would be down in here. And there's an aneurysm. If you blow it up, there's a saccular berry aneurysm compressing part of cranial nerve 3. So cranial nerve 3 is going to be not functioning full power, so you need to know the function of cranial nerve 3. And there's a motor function and there's a parasympathetic function. There's a double function with this thing that you got to remember. Um, so if you have a messed up ocular motor nerve, cranial nerve 3, uh, its muscles won't work. So who are its muscles? Well, it's almost all the extraocular muscles, superior rectus, inferior rectus, medial rectus, and, and inferior oblique, but not superior oblique. Remember, that one turns the eye outward and down, kind of non-intuitively. You think superior turns the eye up, but it doesn't. It turns the eye out and down. Uh, and then the lateral rectus, and those are supplied by the trochlear nerve, cranial nerve 6, and the abducent nerve, cranial nerve, or sorry, cranial nerve 4 is the trochlear nerve, cranial nerve 6 is the abducens nerve. That turns the eye straight out. So therefore, a patient with ocular motor nerve paresis, they might have trouble turning their eye in because look at all these muscles that turn the eye in. Superior rectus turns the eye up and in. Inferior rectus turns the eye down and in. Medial rectus turns the eye in. So one of the first problems is they won't be able to turn that eye nasally or, or adduct, A-D-D, -D, adduct the eye. Okay, so make sure you know this. I assume you already know that. Uh, what else does cranial nerve 3 do, though? There's some parasympathetic function it has. So uh, remember sphincter pupillae muscle and the ciliary muscle. Those are also taken out of action. Uh, so the, the sphincter pupillae muscle, uh, that closes, also called the constrictor or the pupil constrictor muscle, that closes the diameter of the um, of the iris, and so you will have a 
decreased pupil diameter uh, or a meiosis or a my, like I, meiosis in somebody with this type of a, uh, a deficit. Or that's what, it, that's what it does, right? Sphincter papillae. Um, it causes a meiosis. Uh, then there's a sphincter dilator muscle that's also engaged. This one's run sympathetically. Remember that superior cervical sympathetic ganglia? That's where the nerve cell bodies are for the dilator pupillae. And those are trying to open the eye uh, because of uh, sympathetic uh, sympathetic tone. You get excited and you stimulate your sympathetics, your eyes. That's why your eyes pop wide open like that. Um, so if you get a lesion of cranial nerve 3, you can't... Your, your light reflex, if you shine a light in this eye, it won't constrict like it's supposed to. And it might even be not full power dilated like that because there's other things, factors affecting this, but it might even be a little bit wider than normal because there's nothing to oppose the pull of dilator pupillae. All right, so definitely know this stuff, and you just had your CCP test, so you guys should be very good with this already. Um, but... So sphincter pupillae deficit when tested via the pupillary light reflex. So there will be no direct light reflex when testing the ipsilateral side. When I say ipsilateral, I'm, I'm saying the lesion side is a way to say ipsilateral. It's assumed that lesion, you're talking about the, the lesion. But the question would be nice if it said the lesion side. So if you shine the light in the right eye, the right pupil is not going to constrict because the sphincter pupillae muscle is shot. It doesn't work because that's, that's controlled by the efferent limb of this reflex, and that's cranial nerve 3. Uh, but the indirect light reflex, if we're shining the light in the right eye still, that one will work fine because the contralateral oculomotor nerve is not affected. So that side's fine. Um, on the other side, if you, if you shine a light, let's say the lesion is in the right oculomotor nerve and you shine the left in the light in the left eye, the lesion's on the right, you shine a light in the left eye, the direct light reflex will work just fine in the left eye, but the indirect light reflex will be out in the right eye because that's the side of the lesion. See how that works? And then the accommodation reflex will be on the side of the lesion. And we'll look at that more specifically because you guys are always messed up on that. All right, so here's the little cartoon. So remember you shine a light in the left eye. The afferent limb or the afferent pathway of this, of this pupillary light reflex, what does that mean? Well, pupillary light, it means light in the pupil causes a reflex uh, contraction of the pupil. So if you shine a light in the left eye, the light goes down the, the, ocu the optic nerve, uh, and then some authors say it crosses, the signal splits here, and goes into the midbrain, into the pretectal nucleus. I've had the other authors say it only goes on one side, but for sure... It comes back on both sides, right? So once it comes out of the pre, the pretectal nuclei, it's going down both ocular motor tracks here, and both ocular motor nerves. So you shine light in the eye; it goes in on the optic nerve, but it comes back on both the left and the right. So it goes in on the left optic nerve. The signal comes back. The reflex action comes back on both the left and the right, oculomotor nerves. So therefore, if you have a lesion right here and it's knocking out, uh, it's knocking out, the lesion would be right here, and it knocks out, oh, there's the lesion right there. Um, if the lesion occurs right there, because the posterior communicating artery would be very close, it's the posterior communicating artery, so if you got a Barry aneurysm, it knocked out this oculomotor nerve, and you shined a light in this eye, well, the, the afferent pathway, or the afferent limb, as it's often called, there's no problem with that. But the efferent, double efferent pathway coming back, this one's broken. 
So your pupil can't do anything here. Your accommodation, you'll have no accommodation of this eye. Uh, you won't be able to turn your eye in here because all the muscles. But the other eye will be fine. And with this pupillary light reflex, it will also be fine. So when you shine the light in the left eye, the right pupil will constrict as normal. That's called the indirect light reflex. And if you switch, if you shine the light over over on this eye, what happens? Well, the signal goes in the same. Uh, it goes into the pretactile nuclei. It comes back on both tracks, but this one's blocked now. So the left eye here will, or the right eye, I'm reading left and right. I'm getting messed up here. So the right eye here, uh, there will be no direct light reflex. Or I'm sorry, there will be a direct light reflex just fine because there's nothing wrong with this right, uh, this right optic nerve. But over here on the contralateral side, this one's blocked, so there will be no indirect light reflex. Right? There'll also be no accommodation on this side still. See how that works? <coughs> Excuse me. All right. The accommodation reflex is always confusing because there's actually accommodation is one of the three responses that you look for in the accommodation reflex. The accommodation reflex has three different responses that you need to look for. And this is the one where you have the patient focus far away on your finger and then you bring your finger or a pen with writing on it is the best way to do this. And you bring this closer and closer and closer uh, to their nose. And you look for the accommodation reflex. Uh, the pathways of the reflex are the same. The ocular motor nerve, or the, the optic nerve, will be the afferent limb. It sees the object coming in and light bouncing off it. And then there's an efferent limb will also be cranial nerve 3. Uh, so, yeah. So they focus off into the distance. You bring an object with writing on it toward their nose, and the doctor watches for three responses. Two of them are easy. So we all know that your eyes cross when you bring. You can do that yourself and look in the mirror. Um, that's called convergence. So back in this example, if you brought the finger, here's the finger, and you're bringing it closer, this eye would rotate in, just fine but this eye would be straight or at least it wouldn't rotate in all the because the oculomotor nerve is taken out so therefore you can't you can't adduct the eye well you can't turn the eye in see how that works <clears throat> uh, also when you bring your finger closer to your face to your nose more light is going to bounce off the finger and it's like kind of shining a light in both of your eyes at the same time so normally you would have meiosis in both pupils as you bring the the finger closer and closer to the eyes both pupils should constrict but if one doesn't constrict that suggests that there's a lesion in the ocular motor nerve on the same side that the pupil doesn't constrict See how that works? All right, so that's everything I just said there. I won't repeat that. Um, but the third one, this is one everybody forgets. So the accommodation reflex, there's an accommodation response. What does accommodation mean? That means that you want to read something really close to your face. Your lens has to fatten up in order to focus on something close up has to accommodate and that's that's called accommodation um, and so that's also moderated by cranial nerve 3 parasympathetic division as well so we'll look here at in a second at how that works but remember the ciliary uh, well the cil the, there's a reflex ciliary muscle contraction that's kind of the star but that's supplied by cranial nerve 3 but this is confusingly called accommodation is part of the accommodation reflex. So remember the anatomy of the eye. Normally, the ciliary body has these little spider webs or these little ligaments called zonula. 
that are connected, or zonulae, I guess would be plural, are connected to the side of the lens, normally the ciliary body is, con uh, is in a state of, um, of relaxation. So when it's relaxed, it actually pulls these tight and stretches out the lens a little bit. So you can kind of see a medium distance type thing. When the ciliary body contracts via cranial nerve 3, it actually pokes out forward like this. And it loosens these zonula ligaments. And then your eye naturally wants to be in a state of fatness, should I say. It doesn't like to be stretched out. So the eye will contract and get thicker to accommodate close-up vision. So in order to see something close, you have to contract your ciliary body. In order to do that, you have to have cranial nerve 3 working normally. So that is kind of the story with accommodation. All right, everything I said. All right, so summing it all up for the accommodation reflex. So convergence should be normal. So both eyes should turn in if cranial nerve 3 muscles are working. Meiosis should be normal. Both pupils could, should constrict because of the extra light bouncing off your finger as it gets close. That means both sphincter pupillae muscles are working. And the accommodation should be normal uh, because as you need to read close up, you, you send a signal through cranial nerve 3 to contract the ciliary body, which loosens the zonula and allows the lens to snap back to its full thickness shape. Right, so that's, that's enough about that. Uh, here is a cadaver picture of a fatal berry aneurysm. Look how big it was. It was huge, you can still see here, but look at all the blood all over the place here. So, how about some associations with berry aneurysms? Some risk factors, actually. That would probably be a better word. Cigarette smoking. Hypertension. Makes sense. The pipes are pressurized. About 50% of berry aneurysm uh, patients actually have hypertension. Atherosclerosis. We already talked about the vicious cycle between atherosclerosis and hypertension. So these are three risk factors or associations, whichever word you want to use. The connective tissue diseases, right? If you don't have super strong connective tissue, uh, then you're at risk. Ellis Danlers type 4, neurofibromatosis, neurofibromatosis type 1, Marfan syndrome, Louis Dietz. Coarctation of the order, we'll actually talk about that just before we get out of here. Very important topic. So turn off the video, go get a coffee or soda, whatever, because this is important stuff, right, for chiropractors, because this is one of our nemesis. So let's talk a little bit about the vertebral artery anatomy, which we've covered in spinal anatomy, but here's the subclavian artery. We have a vertebral artery takes off the subclavian, and before it enters the transverse foramen, this naked piece here is called V1. V2 is the part that travels, and it starts in C6, remember. C7 is spared, but the vein goes through C7. Anyway, V2 goes all the way up to C2. But after C2, that's the end of V2. It's a very straight piece. But this, pay, this is the trouble piece right here, V3. It comes out, it does... It does about a 90 degree bend here and it comes out of C2 transverse foramen, does another maybe 60 degree bend to go through the transverse foramen of C1, then it does a 100 degree bend or more, give or take, uh, to go into this groove for the vertebral artery here in the, lat in the atlas. And that uh, this is still all V3. That's why most of these dissections occur in V3 because it's so twisty. And then once it goes through the thecal sac and becomes intrathecal, that's part four. So let's not forget the four parts of the vertebral artery. Here's another look at you know, that crazy bend right here. You can see why atherosclerosis loves to build up right here. 
Um, the author messed this up. A beautiful picture, but they completely messed it up. Because remember, the vertebral artery travels in the groove for the vertebral artery behind the lateral mass here. And so this should have been diving in right here. This is the posterior atlanto-occipital membrane. So it, it should have been covering all this. So come on, authors, get your anatomy right. Nice picture, though, anyway. So vertebral artery dissections. It's just, a dis it's just like the dissecting aneurysms we talked about in the aorta, only they're much, much more rare. Dissections are by far more common uh, in the aorta than any place else. But they can occur here as well. And we know what they are, right? They're a, there's my little drawing. There's an artery. This is a vertebral artery. And they usually occur when you get a rip or tear in the tunica intima. And let's make the layers. Here's the tunica media. And here's the tunica adventitia. Let's make the tunica media double layered. There's the adventitia right here. So the blood will go through the tunica intima, get into the tunica media, but hit that external elastic laminae, and it can't get through there. So instead, it just starts ripping its way down the tunica media. And then it can double barrel if it goes back in to the mainstream. And that's a dissection. It may or may not. It could also bleed, right? It could also leak out. It could also rupture. But that's a dissection right there. And, um, yep, this tearing, when it starts tearing, it, uh, it can occur over hours or days. May or may not double barrel, but there's always going to be blood clots inside here. If it double barrels, all these blood clots are going to be set loose. And you've just bombed your brain with all these blood clots. And you're going to get some tissue death because of that. These are always false aneurysms because of the rip. Almost always, I should say. Occasionally, you can get, remember the vasorum, The little artery system. These Sometimes they have a vasorum, and you can get a rupture of the vasorum in the outer portion. Uh, which it does extend into the tunica media, and you can get a bleed that way, but that's um, that doesn't happen as often. All right, uh, so just like the aorta, you can get if it doesn't double barrel, the pressure inside the false lumen or in the, inside the dissection in the tunica media can push that false lumen into the true lumen and narrow the true lumen. Um, go back and I'm not going to try to draw that, but go back and you know, review the aneurysm section uh, if you don't understand that. Uh, but yeah, if you beaver dam the true lumen, well then you're going to get a downstream ischemia and you're going to start to get maybe TIA symptoms at first and then maybe some real brain death and that's a stroke. Especially the vertebral artery supplies the spinal cord, brain stem, and cerebellum mainly. So you can get a stroke related to death of the tissue here. And then double barreling, of course, as I said, you can release a barrage of emboli. And uh, that's no good because it's going to kill some of this tissue. It's going to kill the downstream brain stem. Or, and you need your brain stem to live too, right? So people can die real easily from this. Um, okay. This is actually what case that I was legal chiropractor is being sued over this one. I won't reveal the details of the case, but I do do a little bit of that work every now and then. Not as much as Cooperstein does a lot of work, a lot of defense work. But here's one I was involved with, uh, with a chiropractor. Unfortunately, adjusted somebody and they had a catastrophic stroke. And sometimes there's a risk factor, and you wouldn't know this unless you ordered some testing, and it was in your records. Uh, but this is a arteriogram here, CT arteriogram, where they fill the arteries with contrast, and you can see the vertebral artery light lit up. And you can see, here's the reading right one, just looks fine. But look at this left one. See how all of a sudden, for first of all, it's 
too skinny to begin with. So that's called the hypoplastic vertebral artery, which is a known risk factor for these types of stroke. Uh, but you can see that it's only filling about half. The true lumen is being squished by the false lumen. So we have a big dissection which occurred in this patient. And then when it double barreled during the adjustment, all the blood clots released and the, the brainstem got bombed and the cerebellum got bombed and the patient had a huge stroke because of it. But yeah, that's a risk factor, congenital hypoplastic uh, vertebrae. You can see those on MRI sometimes, so you should be aware of those. Radiologists won't usually point those out either, unless it's really bad. Uh, what about more risk factors for these dissections? Genetics, it's thought to be a genetic connection between these things. Again, the connective tissue disorders, don't have to go over them again. There are some other risk factors for these cervical dissecting vertebral artery dissections. This could be internal carotid artery dissections too. All of these could be for both just di cervical dissections. When they say cervical dissections, um, they're referring to vertebral artery and internal carotid artery. Internal carotid artery dissections are actually more common. History of migraine, patients with a history of migraine, patients who've used oral contraceptives, estrogen-based for a long time, um, alpha-1, antitrypsin deficiency, hyperhomocystinemia. I used to talk about that, but it's so rare uh, that I've taken that out. But malformations of the coronary artery system is also associated with these. What's the concept? A lot of stars here. What's the concept of this precipitating event? So chiropractic manipulation is a precipitating event. So usually someone will have a double barrel going, or someone will have a dissecting aneurysm going on, and this could be vertebral artery or an internal carotid artery, and it's filled with blood clots, but it hasn't double barreled yet. It hasn't ruptured. It hasn't went back into the, the main bloodstream flow. And if you give it a little push, sometimes a little tiny push, is a little force, is all it takes to double barrel the aorta. And that's kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back. A camel can carry one straw, but if you have, if it's ready to go, it just takes a little push. And that's what this, what it, what a precipitating event is. Uh, so what are some of the precipitating events? Let's just look at them here. Um, so precipitating events are Chiropractic, I mean, any manipulation, cervical, ther physical therapists manipulate the spine as well. Yoga positions, George's test, painting, overhead work, putting in ceiling tiles, anything overhead can do this. Any Specifically, anything that puts your head and cervical spine in hyperextension combined with lateral flexion combined with the same side rotation. That's George's test, which we... I mean, my malpractice insurance back in the day mandated that you did George's test on all your patients. And now, because it does put your cervical spine in a danger position and can actually cause double barrels, um, it's not recommended. At this school, we don't use it. I don't think anywhere in the country uses it anymore because it can cause the, uh, the, the stroke because of double barreling. Again, the, the precipitating events are the, exactly the same ones for berry aneurysms with regard to bleeding or starting the dissection. Anything that increases intrathecal pressure will increase blood pressure. So the same ones, constipation, bearing down, valsalvas, giving birth, orgasm, coughing all the time, weightlifting. What about, let's look at grade 5 manipulation. I think Dr. Sousa or somebody's going to cover this in depth. So I'm not going to go crazy into this, but chiropractic manipulation is definitely associated. It's definitely a precipitating event. And there's plenty of chiropractors been sued over this, and it's super, super unlucky. But, I mean, if it's, it's the chances of this happening are not, I mean, it's like winning the lottery, in my opinion. But what does the research say? Research is, of course, the medical people, some medical doctors still hate chiropractors, and I'll show you a perfect example of that here in a minute. Uh, but what is the prevalence of, of a 
stroke following a chiropractic manipulation? Well, PARC, it's approximately 1 in 20,000 spinal manipulation. I believe that's probably a fair number. It's, it's, a, it's a little more rare than Marfan syndrome. It does happen, uh, but uh, it's, it's really rare. The worst report was by Chen, a Chen paper, who said 1% of chiropractic manipulations cause stroke, and that's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, and then this paper uh, showed it was 0 0.00004. I think that's probably a little too conservative. Um, but yeah, again, in that Chen paper, Smith says there's a six time fold risk for stroke following a chiropractic manipulation. I think that's a little overboard, but nevertheless, that's what I mean. Medical school, medical students see this and they think, oh, cervical manipulation causes stroke. 2014. The American Heart Association and the American Stroke Association published this statement, quote, most population control studies have found an association between chiropractic manipulative therapy and vertebral artery dissection in young patients. Patients should be informed of the statistical association between cervical dissection and chiropractic manipulation prior to having a manipulation of the cervical spine. And at least this school has taken this to heart, and we will teach you, and I think it's next quarter with Dr. Feinberg. I think, um, well, I know they will because I used to teach that lab. We will practice informing a patient about the risk of stroke and how to do that properly just to, because we're an evidence-based school and we like to follow important associations like the American Heart Association, the American Stroke Association. So dissections it causes ischemia. We've kind of talked about this. I mean, here's the this this the it causes the luminal stenosis in the true lumen is stenotic because the false lumen pushes into it, and you should understand that. If you don't, go back to my aneurysm lecture. Uh, but it causes a downstream ischemia, so you're not going to get good blood flow uh, to the brain stem, the cerebellum, and such, and it can start out as TIA, trans ischemic attack symptoms, where you get a warning that something's wrong and you get confused and maybe a little paresis, a little weakness on your right side or left side, or you lose your balance. They're like pre-stroke symptoms, so you have to pay attention. If double barreling occurs and you release those blood clots as emboli and they get stuck and take out half of your cerebellum, you're in big, big trouble. Or take out your you know, brainstem and you can't breathe anymore, you'll die from that. Uh, causes of the beaver dam, well, it's the hematoma, right? And it, uh, we've talked about that. And again, it's dangerous if double barreling occurs and uh, the embolism will flow. Or, or here's another one, I haven't talked about this. What, a, what about an embolism f coming from upstream? Well, Who's close to the, since the vertebral artery comes off the subclavian artery, uh, and the subclavian artery comes off basically the aortic arch. Well, one of them does. One of them comes off the brachiocephalic trunk, but all close to the aortic arch. So people with atrial fibrillation are notorious for getting arterial embolisms floating around, and they can go up and go up through your vertebral artery and cause a beaver dam right at uh, V3 there, right where those crazy bends happens. And if you get a beaver dam there, you get downstream ischemia, and you're going to have yourself a big stroke from that. So embolism from our AFib can also cause uh, this type of cerebellar stroke. And of course, yeah, the artery can rupture just like any artery, and it'll leak blood out, so you get a downstream ischemia, not from the beaver dam, just because you're siphoning off half or more of the blood from that artery. And so that can cause an ischemic stroke as well. This typically, these occur in V4, uh, tends not to be quite as strong as the other parts of the vertebral artery. So these types of things tend to happen in V4. And then, you know, not to, to go back to this again, the subarachnoid hemorrhage. If you do have a bleed in V4, uh, you're in the intrathecal space, or in the intrathecal space, but you're in the 
you're specifically in the subdural space or in the in the uh, subarachnoid space. And we've already talked about how that causes reflex vasospasm of other blood vessels that live within that space via endothelin, and not a good thing. 40% of uh, mortality rate, even with treatment, if this even happened in a hospital and you're ready to treat it, uh, these subarachnoid hemorrhages because of a vertebral artery bleed. Not a good thing to have. How do you make the diagnosis? Vertebral artery CT angiography is the gold standard at this time. There are seven Tesla MRI ang angiography machines, but there are very, not many machines around. So CT angiography is still the gold standard. Cervical MRI is not bad for looking at these things. If you use a T1 fat suppressed image, uh, let's take a look at one, a couple of these here. So here's a T1 fat suppressed image, which would show normal pulsating moving blood as black. And if you have blood that's stagnant in a false lumen of a dissection like this, it shows up as bright white. So here's a patient who uh, had a massive stroke and they did a simple MRI, caught this. Right? Here's another one. So this one has a bilateral mural hematoma, I mean massive hematoma. This The true lumen is in black. So they're getting very, very little blood flow uh, to the brain and they had a, were getting vertigo from cerebellar problems. All right, talk about an example of chiropractors not being treated fair. So we've been meaning to write a response. I don't think anybody's done this yet. Dr. Snow was on board with this, but I mean, this is ridiculous. And this is a fairly reputable journal, this Biomed Res Rev, impact factor of 2.1 is not bad, 2018 article. And in the paper, they use the... I don't. I haven't checked these references out to see where they came from yet. I just don't have the time. Maybe Cooperstein can get on to that since he's the director of research. But somebody needs to address this. One in 48 chiropractors have killed a patient. That is absolutely outrageous statement. Just a ridiculous statement to say something like that. And they even quote. They, I, you know, I wish I had time to dig into this more. And they're recommending, this is a group of neurosurgeons, by the way, who wrote this, neurospine surgeons. Um, and then they recommend that chiropractors don't be allowed to do cervical manipulation because, uh, because we don't know how to diagnose. Chiropractors are inexperienced at detecting the signs and symptoms of a dissection. So therefore, we, we, we should have medical clearance for cervical manipulation. We are taught thoroughly to look for these symptoms. You'll have classes in exactly what to look for. So another, uh, but uh, spinal manipulation is potentially dangerous procedure without good evidence supporting its use. I mean, there's plenty of papers that show uh, it's, it's, especially combined with exercise, that it, it's good at combating chronic pain. It's better than opioids in some studies. So... Uh, but this statement right here, I mean, this is the editor's, somebody, the editorial staff of the journal should have really looked into that. That's just, I I mean, we wouldn't be in business if that was true, right? That's ridiculous. So anyway, okay, enough of that rant. Uh, treatment for these aneurysms, just like any or of these dissections, there's going to be a blood clot involved. So you're going to use streptokinase to break up the thrombus formation. Maybe you caught it before it double-barreled and you want to break that blood clot that's inside the tunica media. Use heparin to prevent further clotting, anticoagulation therapy like Coumadin or Xarelto. Uh, thrombolysis is very dicey in this region. Uh, they could put a stent and try it, but very high death rates following these types of techniques. So 70% death rates have been reported when trying with monkeying around with these things. So it's just not a good thing to get a, a bleed or thrombus formation in either the internal carotid or the vertebral artery. All right, whew, let's change subjects here. Talk about, I promise we'd talk a little bit about coarctation and then we're out of here. Talked about this in lab, but remember, of course, blood comes blasting out of the aorta, ascending aorta. There's the, there's the aortic arch here. Coarctation is a congenital narrowing 
that occurs right usually right after ligamentum arteriosus and it can be this bad I mean this looks exaggerated but it can be really bad um, it's usually not that bad it's probably like that so you still have some blood flow going down there uh, but it's a beaver dam so you have really high pressure up here and so all these pulses uh, the the carotid artery pulses are going to be uh, quite pronounced or excessive um, same with there's the left subclavian there's the right subclavian all these going down to the brachial artery pulse and the radial pulse all the pulse they're going to be crazy high yet the pulses down low like your femoral pulse popliteal pulse tercellus pedis pulse uh, posterior tibial pulse are going to be low because you got a you don't have as much blood the blood pressure is trickling so that's one of the big clinical signs of this coarctation it's the fourth most congenital heart defect so it is out there uh, more males than females it's about like marfan syndrome 0.01 percent of the chance uh, but that's actually its incidence is 0 0.01 uh, its prevalence is probably higher than Marfan syndrome. But there are genetic relations, twins and first degree relatives. If they have it, you have a chance of getting it as well. Here is a ascending aorta, aortic arch. This is a 3D reconstructed CT. And you can see, and really, blood is having trouble getting through here. And because it's being narrowed so sharply, it's caused an aneurysm because of the spray Remember when you like putting your finger over the hose, the spray stretches out the aorta here, the descending aorta. There are some associated conditions, as we said already, berry aneurysm. If you have one of these things, you have to watch out for berry aneurysm. And then the other congenital heart malformations, a, a patent ductus arteriosus, bicuspid aortic valve, patent foramenal volley, which isn't, by the way, considered a congenital heart defect as we'll learn what are the keys again I just said lower pulses will be really diminished but the upper pulses including the carotid pulse and superficial temporal arteries will be very exaggerated and yeah we explained that already all right that's enough for your brains we'll see you all on Thursday